Let the DDFP begin, presented by McDonald's. Chris Wessling, Patrick Claybon with us in Studio 66. First up in the no huddle, Chris Wessling. Eric Decker's out there saying that Ryan Fitzpatrick is going to be the quarterback of the Jets. Is this an issue at all that he's that the wide receivers out there announcing what's going to be before he's actually inked? Not even close to an issue. Total non-issue. The Jets general manager has come out and said Ryan Fitzpatrick is our QB1 once he gets signed. Everybody, I think everybody in the league just assumes this is going to happen. Claybon, how say you? We saw Bill O'Brien on Hard Knocks last year say, hey, lie to everybody. This is much better than that. So I'm uh, being honest. You, the, the cardinal rule on DDFP is no jive. Don't jive me. However, if you're the wide receiver out there shooting your mouth off without the blessing of management, you're kind of opening up a can of worms. The other side of that coin is Tom Condon a week or two ago, unnecessarily announced, hey, Sam Bradford, we had a deal worked out with the Broncos, but now he's going to go back to Philly. That's just making trouble where you don't need to have trouble. I felt better about Sam Bradford after that, that he wanted to go play for a Super Bowl winner instead of the narrative that he just didn't want to compete for a job. Oh, I feel bad for Sam Bradford now. He's going to hear it all through the season unless he comes out uh, house on fire like Mike Vick circa 2010 or whatever season. Which was. he was going to have to play well anyway. Otherwise, they were going to hate him anyway. So Yeah, like, true enough. All right, we don't just talk about the game of pro football. We talk of the game of life and specifically the game of pro basketball right now. OKC, Golden State, now knotted up at one out west. Where's this series headed? Patrick Claybon. I think it's headed seven games because I, I want to see seven games. And uh, I think this Oklahoma City team is a lot better than they were when they had leads in the fourth quarter against the same Warriors team that won 73 games. So why not? Let's, I let's agree with all. that. The assumption that they're going to continue to play the way they did back in October and November, this team has evolved quite a bit. OKC has. Wes, I'll say you. agree with all of these points, but <laughs> as Black Ty said before the show, the Warriors are going to win every game the rest of the way, sweep the rest – Three, three remaining games, 73 wins. I think we forget about that sometimes. The Thunder are better than they were early in the season. The Warriors, you know, we used to talk about the Spurs for their ball movement and teamwork. To me, the Warriors are that right now, and I, I just think they're too good to – I think they're too good not to sweep. It is a weird place we are in the world. Maybe it's owed to social media and the immediate reaction, but the cynics in the media have now spawned a myriad cynics out there, trolls, whatever you want to call them. We have to, we, we can't take 90 seconds to just appreciate greatness. We have to we have to start knocking it down a little bit. I'm with you about the Warriors. This is an all-time team, maybe the all-time team. They do have to complete the deal, and they've got a lot in front of them. This OKC team is not jive. I think it goes six. I think OKC takes one back in uh, Oklahoma City to force a six game. Then that Cavs series, oh, that's going to be juicy. And that, like we said, this team has progressed over the course of the season. This is uh, – I don't think that's going to be a walkover for Steph and company when uh, when Cleveland rolls to town. But then again, maybe I'm, uh, I'm jumping the gun here. Hey, the, the Cavs haven't even moved on yet, right? I don't trust anyone coming out of the <laughs> <In> East. theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could talk about uh, Cle. I know the assumption that Cleveland, uh, anything that believe land. I mean, you know, at some point you're starting to be rubes, people. At Cleveland, you know, <laughs> the the sports gods are against you. That much is clear. Um, hey, so after the in the Eastern Conference, the most recent game in the press conference, somebody, I think it's Dave McMenamin, uh, the reporter, who said this in comparison uh, compared LeBron and Kyrie to a couple of football guys. For both you guys, Kevin Love likened you two to the old USC Trojan uh, backfield of Lendale White and Reggie Bush, LeBron being Lendale and Kyrie being <laughs> Reggie. <laughs> I, I wanted to get uh, your guys' thoughts on that comparison. <laughs> No, that's you. That's you. I'm a dookie. No, I don't want to do it that way. No, no, no. You got it. Uh, <laughs> come on, man. Don't do <laughs> Thanks, Kev. That's, that's all I got to say about it. <laughs> Thanks, Kev. Let's play the game here, Wes. I don't know if I like that comparison, and I certainly wouldn't like being compared to Lendale White. Um, <laughs> well, modern-day Lendale White. I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but if he continued to progress where he left off, uh, you know, a man of that carriage is not uh, is not one to be compared to. Chris Wessling, why don't you go ahead and make a NBA football comp for us? All right, I made this comparison before 
the catch. Michael Jordan and Odell Beckham. And uh, let me unpack this for you. I think both of these guys, you can take your grandma. You can take someone who's not even a sports fan, put them down in front of a game, and their eyes will naturally go to Odell Beckham or Michael Jordan as the best athlete on the field. I think, hmm. I think their graceful, world-class athleticism is that obvious. And then hand size, Odell Beckham's hands, bigger than Calvin Johnson, 6'5", 240. Phil Jackson, when you hear him talk about Michael Jordan versus Kobe Bryant, the first thing he brings up is Jordan's hand size. In addition to that unstoppable first step he had, he could toy with Kobe a little bit. Kobe can't do all this stuff around the rim. And then the last thing, Dominique Wilkins probably a more explosive vertical leaper. Jordan, better hang time, midair dexterity to kind of switch hands. And I think there's an improvisational creativity to his game. And Odell Beckham has that too. Hmm, interesting, but also conditions himself with unorthodox uh, uh, training methods. He has the wonky equipment manager, Ed Skiba, does uh, Odell Beckham throw him wonky passes in the pregame to help him get used to adjusting and making those one-handed catches. Claybon, how say you? Making a, a straight athletic comparison, I kept racking my brain. Uh, TD has a, a pretty solid article on, on NFL.com right now comparing the guys, but if, if I could try to get a mindset pick, the thing that jumped out at me was the beards of Ryan Fitzpatrick and James Harden and also the <laughs> ideas from their fan bases that they need these men to win. It's is weird to me. <laughs> oh, that's so boring. They both play defense at the same level too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the exact same amount of defense. And, and the, that's uh the, that was the parallel. Yeah, one might say mind. that they both uh, really outright help the other team with uh, with some of the choices they make out there. Bartlett behind the glass. Yes, black tie his pieces up on nfl.com. Go look at it. He makes all those pro comps for you. Bartlett, why don't you give me one? Uh, well, I mean, there's a lot on there. One I liked was uh, Kevin Durant, A.J. Green. I think that's a good mix. Both players long. Both players can jump for it, go up and grab the ball. Uh, I, th I thought that was a good one from Black Tie's article that he pointed out. What about – how about this one? I'm going to reach on this one. Cam Newton and Tom Chambers blowing up certain assumptions that you might have about uh, – based on skin color. Is that a reach? I know you don't like that, Wes. You think that that's race-baiting kind of stuff. Is that – that's actually not even that good because Tom Chambers could jump out of the gym – and that blows up. Actually, what we're looking for is a pocket-passing uh, black quarterback, right? Tom Chambers, to me, everybody remembers that one dunk where he hits the guy in the chest and goes even higher. Six foot ten, dude. And he wasn't gracefully athletic. I don't know. He was All right, that's not a good one. <laughs> Famous Jameis. How about that one? A guy who you assume a lot of people a year ago said, oh, this guy's going to be able to run. And, you know, I, I did predict he'd score a lot of touchdowns with, with his feet, but that's because he's a rugged runner, not because he has breakaway speed. Maybe that's the better. Compare. Jameis Winston and Draymond Green. I, I th hmm. you might, if you're looking for that, you might need to go away from the quarterback position and go to like a Julian Edelman or, or yeah. somebody, like, a, like a Tim Dwight, an Olympic-level sprinter that, that people somehow hold on to these stupid – Jordy Nelson, yeah. yeah, Jordy Nelson and Tom Chambers, except uh, Wes just blew up Tom Chambers <laughs> as, not, as not being terribly athletic. All right, play the theme music. Yes, welcome to the Dave Damashek football program. As mentioned previously, we are presented, as always, by McDonald's. Go fill your belly up with some all-day breakfast, if you please. We have much to get to, including our ongoing series with Kevin Love, killing time till the season starts with uh, with Shaq and, more importantly, Kevin Love. And we have a very important piece. We got we, we cross the, uh, the sports lines once again here. He has uh, another Chicago sports team in his past, and we're going to dig in on that and some potential raw feelings that that team may have towards Kev, towards uh, towards our guy there. We'll dig in on that in hey, the Shaq, meantime. Shaq, Shaq, got to stop you now. We're, we're still going here, but it's you said Kevin Love. It's not Kevin Love you're spending time with. Kyle Long. Did I say Kevin Love the whole time? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're just mesmerized by the. You see. I do see. Right I do see skin color. See, we're, we 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 start digging in on that, and I start Same calling initials. Kyle Long, Kevin Love, facial hair. One has hair on top of his head, the other one doesn't. All right, I screwed that up. Kyle Long is who we're gonna talk to. That's what I meant to say. Get off my back. You don't humiliate me in front of my guests. They are Chris Wessling from around the NFL. Make sure you check out his fine pages, his colleagues' fine pages, and, of course, the tremendous Thrice Weekly podcast. 
all the news, always delivered with a bit of mirth. And then, of course, the guy you see on NFL Network giving you all the updates. And, by the by, a guest of uh, the Around the NFL podcast, um, I think within the last 24 hours, a, a coveted uh, guest to get inside Studio 66. Yeah, I, I happen to sit close to the guys, and occasionally they, they're like, hey, you want to be on the – of course. Yeah. It's the same situation when you exactly. race through the news. That's what happens to me. Like, we are <laughs> desperate for a guest around the NFL, guys. Can you do it? No, one, two, three, none of you. Like, Claybon. I mean, no, listen, always a pleasure uh, when uh, Claybon joins us here. And let's start off with this. I know you guys dug in on it on the uh, ATN show, but I want to talk a little bit about it here. Robert Griffin III, and I guess this in, in some small way plays off of what we led the show with, with Eric Decker talking and, and, and opining. Now, I hear what Wes is saying that, of course, this merely supports what Jets management said about Fitzpatrick another conversation we could have whether or not th that's the greatest idea in the world that the idea that ryan fitzpatrick walks in like yes we're back to super bowl contention are you um anyway let's talk about robert griffin the third who three years after the fact is getting some heat these days for apparently walking into a dc coaches meeting and on the whiteboard telling them what they need to be doing clay bond how say you you had it exactly right three years ago and I feel like Jason Reed has, has written this story uh, multiple times. And, and it came from the position of the, of the undefeated, which we were told, you know, was, was going to be the Black Grantland. And then I, I start reading it and I get to I get to some parts and it's like, wait, what? There, there were some. To be fair, the undefeated has been in the works for like two plus years. So maybe he wrote it and it's like, hey, this is still fresh. Go with this. <laughs> still still relevant. I thought he wrote it. As someone who's written long articles and you need to come up with the kernel of an idea, I thought he wrote it from the angle of the Browns have African-American general manager, coach, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator. Robert Griffin III is an African-American quarterback. I'm an African-American writer. This is an American African-American website. There has to be a story there. Mm -hmm. He couldn't put all the pieces together in a cohesive whole there. I'll say this. Uh, do uh, do the Around the NFL podcast a favor or at least uh, pull it for this show. I like Chris Wessling out of context saying, I'm an African-American writer. <laughs> I want I want to play that over and over again. Like, he gets confused sometimes. when he if, gets, you, if you Google my road I had pick. too much moonshine <laughs> on the island again. I forget what color I am sometimes. Google my Road to World <laughs> profile pic, and I look like Red Fox. <laughs> Undefeated, can I ride for you? I understand. Well, listen. All right, let's. Uh, so let's transition from RG3. Before we do, though, actually, it did remind me of something. I'm a little bit on RG3's side, if we can go back to three years ago. If Mike Shanahan, I don't know him, and I don't know RG3, but I'm not surprised if Shanahan was a little raw. These head coaches think they know better. They don't want anybody else telling them what to do. I have a little firsthand experience with this. A few years back, round about RG3's explosion, I met with uh, Brad Childress to give him my – I mean, I, I didn't have to do it. I gave him an idea for what I considered some great X in and O, and, and, uh, and just take a look at how that went. But this is a little play that I've come up with, and I think that it would be great if when you get back on the sideline, this would be a great play for you to run over and over again. All right, as you can see here, I've got it in the uh, pro set offense. By the way, the offense are, are the, the O's. All right, I'm just making sure you're up to speed on offense, defense. Okay, so here's the play. See if you can follow what I'm doing here. The quarterback hands it off to the running back. Then the running back goes left and then runs – and doesn't get tackled, and goes for a touchdown. Six points. If you want to see more, I got a lot more. I got one where the quarterback throws it to the wide receiver, and then he catches it, and then he runs for a touchdown. The only thing is, I don't see a block on that board there. Yeah, but that'll happen, though, because I'll tell these guys, the offensive linemen, I'm going to say to them, hey, block those guys. You know, pretend that these X's are defensive players and block them you know and then I'm going to tell the running back when he's got the ball hey if one of these X's tries to tackle you don't let him you know just keep going until you're in the end zone and you oh, know I, I get it hit him if you must miss him if you can right yeah yeah avoid contact at all costs I don't know what you're saying but yes I Dave, think we're on the same hold page. on Dave did did you ever play football uh, I, I I played a lot actually three on three in the backyard and uh 
If you don't mind me saying so, well, I was pretty good. Did you, did you wear a helmet when you played football? No, I did not. You might should have. So what you're saying is I belong in the NFL? Not at all. Fine. You cannot use this play. He high hats me. I get. I mean, I don't have to offer that play to him. You know what? I'm going to choose another team. I'm going to send that off to Todd Haley, maybe, and let the Steelers use my uh, my magic Gifford play design. Didn't RG3 actually run that play against? A the few Vikings? times, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I speak about Tybee Island all the time because I spent time there. Might should have is is a phrase that's used often. <laughs> As soon used to, as I saw children say cook. that, I thought that that's exactly <laughs> that's that's West speak. You're there. You want to go down to the bar? Well, we might could. Might should have. Might we might should get to time to get over to the bar right now. We got to get the huckapoos. <laughs> Them beers ain't gonna drink themselves now, fellas. We used to could. All right. <laughs> now let's get back to uh, one of our favorite segments. It's time for dead or alive. So good. All right, here we go. The doctor on call will give us the final diagnosis, but we ask uh, the the res. Uh, I guess that's what we all are. We're residents right now. That's yeah. that's the status we would be. Let's all pretend we're on Grey's Anatomy right now, and uh, and indicate one of us what, would die. Yeah, well, yeah, that's exactly right. There'd be a fire somewhere. There'd be a shooter coming through here and everything, and uh, so on. But uh, I doubt any of those things are going to happen right now. Let's start with RG three here. RG3's career as a starter in Cleveland with Hugh Jackson and the rest there. Chris Wessling, dead or alive? And I'm, I'm kind. this one kind of projects ahead, uh, not super long term, but, you know, let's t- look at it, say, November-ish of 2016. As much as I respect Hugh Jackson as a coach and his ability to get the best out of quarterbacks, nothing I've seen on game film from Robert Griffin III tells me that he's going to be able to be a pocket passer be able to read defenses, and to be able to lift this Browns offense. In fact, nothing tells me he's going to beat out Josh McCown for the starting job. I, it is one of the conundrums of the last couple of months. Has everyone forgotten Josh McCown was the starter for the majority of the season last yes. year? I know he's not I know he's not he's great, Josh but McCown. is there? Uh, it's as though, well, there's no chance. I mean, it's Robert Griffin the third or the kid from USC. Hey, there's another guy who has started some games. Uh, Claybon, how say to, you? To borrow from uh, Jason Reed's uh, piece, and I'm looking here, and I see that Gruden's support of Cousins, this is a quote, infuriated African-American fans. As Jason Reed paints with his broad brush and assigns the feelings of a nation um, <laughs> with his with his article here, stuff like this is going to die. This is going to die. RG3's career is going to be alive and well. Oh. We're going to bury the stupid stuff and eventually talk about Robert Griffin playing football, and that's going to be awesome to me. All right. I hope so. It, Mike Shanahan will no longer be asked for a quote <laughs> with regards He's to He's going to give one anyway. All that right. dies. You are amateur physicians. Let's hear what the doctor has to say on this one. Dead or alive? <laughs> oh, no. Sorry, Bobby Griffin. I'll tell you, I'm conflicted here because – First of all, as I've said many times, I'm going to say it again. You know what would be the cool move for him to get back on the map in the zeitgeist for non-football fans or, or to the broader football audience? He needs to change his number to three, but I mean the Roman numeral three, like at the end of his name. That would be a cool thing that at least. Be- that would get some heat, and it would help break up those hideous uniforms that the Browns <laughs> wear. But either way, this is an ongoing thing that we're seeing more and more with Hugh Jackson. Everybody has decided he is guaranteed to be successful. I feel like this is hubris that he has declared oh. that, and not Hugh with an E. Yeah. Ooh, there, you yeah, you get the I you like get it. the intended pun there. Um, this is you know with quarterback specifically. Now he goes and gets the SC kid, and he's and he's declared I see something in RG three that apparently no one else has. The concern for me is can he right the ship RG three because I don't know how many guys. Joe Charbonneau of the Cleveland Indians always comes to mind. Nineteen eighty American League rookie of the year and then just disappears after that. How many cases are there in sports? I know he had the big knee injury, but just. I mean, Mark, you know, Mark Fidrich, I guess, comes to mind, the old baseball pitcher. But really, when in the NFL has a guy had a great, I mean, just an all-time rookie season like that and then just vanished, you know, and never to return? 
from mediocrity or worse. I, I feel like he has a chance, except for the fact that's not a good spot. Corey Coleman comes in, the assumption that a rookie's going to make everything right. Who's he throwing the ball to? Gary Barnage. I feel bad for – I mean, I don't feel bad for him. I'm glad he's getting a shot, Robert Griffin the third. But the but just because he may still have the skills, this is not – I mean, let's remember. Does the Browns he? are atrocious. Does he? Does he have the skills? There's at least video No, I don't know. I don't. being successful in some aspect, right? Well, we can say that. Well, I feel like he came in and, and they won with a gimmick offense with Robert Griffin the third adding a pass-run threat that the NFL hadn't seen. And he's not that fast anymore. He doesn't beat defensive backs and linebackers to the edge anymore. Yep, yep. That was a practical issue for Johnny Football as well. People foretold uh, of that uh, that coming. And it's a nice transition for us, Wes, because RG3 was a part of that rise back in 2012. 12. When You know, I mean, the the read option, the run option, whatever you want to call it, some, you know, variation on, uh, on spreading teams out like that. That was going to be the wave. That was, you know, Colin Kaepernick's blow up and uh, um, so on. And yet, the only guy still doing some variation on that with any consistency and success is Cam Newton. Everybody else has fallen by the wayside. Now the trend, and this is one I have foretold of for two years, is are we are uh, well, I, I'm, I'll answer in just a minute here. Patrick Claibon. The return of power football. We've heard malarkey down in Tennessee and so on. Wes has been talking about it. Mark Sessler's been writing about it at around the NFL. Is power run foot running football dead or alive in the NFL? Alive and well. We just saw the best power running quarterback maybe ever in the Super Bowl. It's it's alive and well. It's yeah, but you know what I mean. I'm talking traditional running, turning around, putting in the gut and uh, – Absolutely. And, and guard pulling and yeah. dominating uh, your opponent physically. Well, we've seen the 49ers, Seahawks and Panthers make it to the Super Bowl with a power running game. And they had the help of a of a running quarterback. But I think you're going to see the Cowboys do this. The Titans do it. The Rams do it. And I think it's going to work. As John Robinson, their general manager, said, all these nickel and dime defenses. Why don't we get big and move these small people off the ball? Well, let's see what the doctor has to say. Power running football. Dead or alive. There we go. You hear it there. It is alive and well. Yes, the ebb and flow. I mean, how much recency bias must you suffer from to assume that when people, oh, oh no, people now it's a it's a passing game now. You know, the uh, the the middle deep is wide open now. You'd be crazy not to take advantage of it. Yes, but there will always be an ebb and flow in football. And like Wes says, Malarkey and company figured it out down there in Tennessee. Even Damashek figured it out. Yes, when, when the defense starts to adjust by going a little bit smaller and faster, then what is the response by the offense? Of course it is to try and bang you a little bit. And I think that you're going to see a lot. And in fact, we've already seen it, as Wes says. It's not like we there isn't already evidence of its return. And I think you're going to see more and more of it. Um, in 2016, maybe the guy you would most want to have standing behind the quarterback if you're going to be running the ball a lot Adrian Peterson, but there are some challengers to his throne as the best running back in the NFL. Let's look at it from a fantasy perspective. Chris Wessling, is Peterson still the top fantasy pick, dead or alive? I think that's dead. Mm -hmm. I don't you want you want a running back who catches the ball more. And he's also okay, he was the best running back. Maybe Doug Martin were the best running backs in the NFL last year. But he's over thirty now. He's not going to be going, giving you his best years. I would go with a guy like Le'Veon Bell, even with the injury risk. Claybon, how say you? I'm I'm going to stick with Adrian Peterson, mainly because I believe in Teddy Bridgewater more than I do Jared Goff, and I think Bridgewater is going to have them in better position than the Rams will, because that's basically the choice that I would be making between Todd Gurley and Adrian Peterson, and so I'm going to stick with AP. All right, let's see what the doctor has to say here. Put on your fantasy cap. <laughs> Dead. Adrian Peterson, no longer the best choice among uh, running backs, or I guess a lot of people now say take wide receivers, uh, take a wide receiver with the first overall pick if you have it. Antonio Brown, it really does kind of boil down to Antonio Brown on some level. You could say, give me one of those two Steelers, Brown or Levy and Bell, 
uh, if you have the first overall pick. To your point, Claybon, I think Laquan Treadwell is going to have a big year. Yeah. I think he's going to be awesome, too. I think that's going to be a great spot for him to be in and uh, so presumably maybe take a little pressure off Peterson to have to carry the full load there. Either way, yeah, I would go Levy and Bell. I'd go Todd Gurley. I would go Zeke Elliott before I would go uh, Adrian Ouch. Peterson. I think Zeke's going to have a monster year in, uh, in Big D. Lastly, Pro Football Focus has declared that J.J. Watt is nothing more than the fourth best defensive player in the NFL, Aaron Donald rightly getting a lot of praise. He is something to watch um, if you keep your eye on the interior, the line of scrimmage. I mean, that guy, you talk about disruptive in the backfield on almost every play. And does it, it seems like, with less power than with just quickness. They don't, The offensive linemen just don't seem to be able to handle the, the speed of Aaron Donald. But is he the number one? Is J.J. Watt's status as the best defensive player, dead or alive, Patrick Claibon? I think it's it's alive. It, it's tough to – the difficulty here is is grading all of these athletes on this on this scale. It, it, it's what we how, do, Claybon. Yeah. There's no wrong answer, I suppose. If you yeah. if you throw out a middle of the road or then you're being crazy. But <laughs> Aaron Donald or J.J. Watt, I guess, you know, you're not insane if you think either way. But, uh, but Wes, how say you? This whole issue is preposterous. <laughs> Pro Football Focus does this every year. How can we generate clicks and attention – they did this with Tom Brady two years ago, calling him no longer elite, and they were flat out embarrassed when he torched the Seahawks secondary in the Super Bowl and was the MVP. So, yes, they are embarrassed again this year. J.J. Watt, of course he's the best player, and I love Aaron Donald, but J.J. Watt isn't fourth. He's, he's first, and he has been for four years. Dr. Football, how say you? J.J. Watt is the best defensive player. Harvey. Yeah, no, you don't have to shout out to me, J.J. That, uh, you did all the work there. Um, what do we think about uh, – yeah, I agree that J.J. Watt is – I mean, uh, what, it, what it's a matter of is consistency. That's, you know, Aaron Donald, do it for another year or two at the same level, and then you start to mirror what J.J. Watt's done – who whatever else is going on, Jadavian Clowney in there, not in there, the offense stinks, whatever. Watt, dominant week after week and year after year at this point. What do we think, though? I find, I, you know, we'll have plenty of time to buzz about the um, uh, about the AFC South and all football matters before things kick off. But, I mean, that that we're, we're talking about a couple of them, Tennessee going power football, the Texans. I know Brock Osweiler with the questions, new quarterback, in, you know, um, in uh, or not new quarterback, but Andrew Luck. That's a fascinating point to me is that Andrew Luck, that everybody's like, ah, forget what happened in 20. Well, that matters that, you know, it's not like you just rejected that team was not good last year. Um, so, and, and then Jacksonville, everyone's hip on them. We talked about them last week or uh, on the last show with Maurice Jones, Drew, who really dug in on Blake Bortles, AKA Blabo. We've given him uh, the oh, new nickname, Blabo. Can he turn the corner? Because all the other additions, the great defensive pieces that the Jags have added now, maybe not all that important if Blabo doesn't elevate his game. Everybody's decided that he's – I, in fact, I listened to the Around the NFL podcast. You all seem in on Blake Bortles as being definitely a good quarterback. I, didn't, I didn't know there was another side to it. <laughs> I, I mean, he throws a lot of interceptions. I mean, he was second in the NFL in touchdowns in his second season. That's pretty good. He's got a lot of pass catchers, he, throwing the ball a lot. He makes too many mistakes, but he's still developing. But you could see the raw tools. I'm not saying he's guaranteed to be Andrew Luck, but, yeah, he's he's an exciting young quarterback. I uh, Exciting young quarterback, yes. But is he going to elevate in year three? Your guess is yes. I, I think so. I think the, as the surrounding talent improves, he will too. All right, let's check, then check before we go on. We got some breaking news. What? This one coming from Ian Rappaport. Jaguars first round pick Jalen Ramsey has suffered a knee injury. No. Saying it's though it sounds like it could be minor. It's characterized now as a small meniscus tear. A second opinion's coming. It said his second opinion, he's going to go get that early next week. And if all goes well, they're hoping he'll be back in time for camp. So. Not the best news coming on the number five overall pick in this draft. Well, the year removed from the third overall pick, Dante Fowler ruining his knee very early in the process there. Oh, man, that's that's uh, 
uh, bad news. Let's hope uh, that that's not the case because I think Jalen Ramsey. Uh Uh-oh. Is Claybon, in fact, got to go and run and talk about that news? Look at the breaking news. It's happening right here on DDFP. Yep. Oh, here comes Claybon. No, do it on the mic, man. We got to be a part of this excitement. <laughs> Claybon's on the way, everybody. Go talk about it, man. Thanks, guys. See you later. Oh, Claybon. Mic drop. A literal mic drop. Dan Hans has refer- referenced the Batman red phone, and that's what just happened. That was all right. The clay phone. I don't know. The, <laughs> yeah, uh, that was uh, great excitement. Um. All right, Wes, do me a favor here. We're going to take a look at my uh, my conversation. You know, you're excited for football to get here already instead of just buzzing about it all the time. So is Kyle Long. So am I. I thought that, you know, best I can do is try and help football players kill the time until the season gets here. This is a fascinating little thing here. Kyle Long, well, I talk about it. He was once drafted by another Chicago team to play another sport, and I brought that up to him. You know what? Cheers. To us. Uh, yeah, to us. Mm. It's All a killing right. time. I don't know if I want to go into this right now. You and I don't know each other that well, but Come on. Um, what happened with the uh, with the Chicago White Sox? You uh, got drafted by them, didn't you? Yeah. And uh, what, and what did you do? What did you tell them? Well, I I had initially said, you know, I'm I'm gonna go to college either way, but. You always want to throw your hat in the ring to find out, as a high school baseball player, you know, if you have a chance of being drafted. Let's just see where this, the chips fall. And they had like 23 other guys they picked before me, so it was like. All right, that, they did what they did. Message received. I got you, but let's not push it back onto them. The white, the Chicago White Sox, of all the people that walk the big blue marble, yep. they decided to say Kyle Long's name. Yeah. And your response to them was thanks, but no thanks. Well, I was going to school. Well, so I thought. How do you think that makes them feel? Probably Florida cool. State sounds pretty cool. They probably didn't like it so much, though, did they? I think they probably picked the wrong guy. There was probably a guy named Carl Lang out there that they meant to pick, and all right, you know what? You somebody can, with an accent in their scouting. You can, you can, me. you can make your jokes, but I bet their feelings were pretty hurt by that, weren't they? Well, and now that you wind up back in Chicago, yeah, it's like, it's like, they. they were a guy chasing like, you, yeah. and you rejected him. And now I'm back in their started, Instagram feed. They started oh. dating his friend, and, I got and now he has to hang news. out with yeah. you all the time now. Like, yo, Stop. I'm here, and I, but I'm you wouldn't right go here. out with me, but now you're hanging out with him, yeah. you know? How do you think that makes them feel? Man, I hadn't really put it in those uh, terms, but uh, that analogy's pretty good. It's. I always wonder, like, had, had I played baseball, had, would I be in the bigs? Would I be in some town, you know, in the middle of nowhere? Would I still be in the White Sox organization, or would I just be pawned off for some guy that come up throwing 100 from the Dominican? Like, Let's patch things up. I want Kyle Long and the Chicago White Sox to patch things up. I'll, do, I'll be the transcriber. You I have pretty good handwriting. Speak from the heart. Dear White Sox. Dear White Sox. Sox. I do not apologize. Well, no, no, no. That's not the first line. That's not going to okay, okay. be winsome. Let's patch this up. Like like the front says. Like the front says. I like to <laughs> emphasize the patching up I want of our broken friendship, relationship. We never had a friendship because I didn't let no, it start. No, no, you're right. You got in the way of that. Got to start at square one. Um, I am if sorry you, I hurt your feelings. How I'm, about that? I'm sorry I left you without a, a left-hander in the mid-90s. When Ooh, it came, mid-90s heat from when the left side. It was a humble brag. It was more like a brag brag. No, yeah, there like, was nothing <laughs> humble. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm sorry that eight years ago I'm I made sorry. a decision to go join a fraternity at a college in the ACC. I hope we can be friends. How about that? Like I hope... I hope I'll see you at the diamond and we can figure this out. There you go. Now this All will... the best. Good. Very nice. Very nice. All the best. Kyle. That was nice. And there it is. There's proof. It really happened. See, it says right on the front there, Wes, let's patch things up. That's nice. I think that's a good first step. If you're the White Sox, though, how does that make you feel? Well, I think 
any time you make a decision to join a fraternity, it's a bad idea. <laughs> so it probably makes the White Sox feel, fans feel pretty bad. I think I think he needs to go out to mend the fence properly. He has to go to Comiskey or whatever they call the joint. And, uh, you know, on the big screen, at least, issue a formal apology. But I hope at least this is a good first step. They should play that video on the big screen at, at Comiskey. Yeah, you should do that, White Sox. That's a that's not a. Oh, it's that time again. Time for the Damashek surprise game show. <laughs> Ryan Bartlett, <laughs> are you ready? Boy, you're a regular. Uh, uh, Rod Roddy. Wink, wink, <laughs> wink, Martindale. Yeah, Rod Roddy. <laughs> I have been on the Price is Right before. Just a little. Is that true? I, and I won the Showcase Showdown. No, what? where's the clip? It's, it's out there. It's hidden. It's, it was basically it was idiot day on the show, and I was the biggest idiot, so I won. It's, it just oh. worked out well. All right. Well, to bring you up to speed, surprise game show, uh, me and the guest or guests trade back and forth with answers to a list that you guys have come up with. I am not aware of it, obviously, and neither are the guests here. I'm 2-0 and oh so far with this game. And, of course, my, uh, my bona fides as a trivia wizard are well known to people around the NFL. Aren't All right, guys. Chris so Wesley. our because I I own the toaster formerly belonging to Chris Wesley. What a trophy that is! The Dave Damashek uh, toaster. Win Dave Damashek's toaster. Yeah, it's a bigger game show than Price is Right. Win Wes's toaster. I know, but I might uh, a lot I... less taxes to pay. I bet on the toaster. <laughs> Let's, uh, so today's game show is brought to us by Kent Brown. Put this together. We've got quarterbacks that have passed for 500 or more yards. In a game Ooh. in the Super Bowl era. Oh, I thought you were going to say in the Super Bowl. I was going to say <laughs> it's going to be a very short list. I can give you the answer one hit here. So there's there's 14 total quarterbacks. 14? That have thrown for at least 500 yards in a single game. Wow. Wow. All right, so we're writing them down, the Wes and I. Off the top of my head, I've come up with only four. That's all I can come up with. All right, Shaq, why don't you get us started? Ooh. I mean, I'll take the obvious one off the table, Ben Roethlisberger. Okay, Wes. Boomer Esiason. Yeah, that's the other one. Wes would get that one as a Bengals fan, but he did it as a Jet, right? I believe he did it with the Arizona Cardinals. Yep, Wes, you were right. He did it with the Cardinals. I don't lose anything, though. That was just – that was <laughs> after my proper an- – or uh, well, that's not even my answer. Absolutely. Oh, man, I don't even know what to do here now. This is a hard uh, – this is a tough – I'm going to go Drew Brees. Drew Brees, he actually has done it twice. So okay. he is one of two players on this list that has done it twice in a game. Okay. I'll go Warren Moon. Warren Moon. Oh, man, are you fe- – I just am curious. Do you feel like you're doing – you feel like you've got a lot banked up here? No, that was the last one that I was really sure of. All right. I mean, he had to have done it at some point. Peyton Manning. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Taking too long. Uh, no! But Wes, in order to win, since I started it, Wes has to come up with an answer. Or else it's a tie. Wes, pressure is on. Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford. We've got a winner. Ah! I'm going to give you my uh, my old coffee maker. Or something. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I'm going to give you a butter knife. Read off the rest of the list here. All right, we've got the rest here. Marino? No, I don't think he ever did no, it. Marino was on there in 1988. Dang! we got Tom Brady. Yeah. How could you forget Vince Ferragamo? Ooh. Vince Ferragamo. I can't even hear you over the music. That's good. Elvis Kerbach, another one. I can't. Am I still can't hear you? Turn up the hearing aid. All right, we got it. Elvis Kerbach. <laughs> I can Kerbach. hear the music fine. I Eli Manning. You. Eli was the Manning brother to have done it, not Peyton. Peyton never did it. That jerk. He does it to me again. Philip Rivers, another one. Philip. Yeah. Tony Romo. Huh. Matt Schaub. Schaub. Oh, Romo in the shootout versus Peyton Manning. About one one. Phil Sims. Matt Schaub so far is the biggest surprise on that list, obviously. Bigger than Elvis Gerbach. Oh, I missed Gerbach. That was when the music was playing. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think you you might have missed two, though. Elvis Gerbach. Vince Ferragamo. Ferragamo. What year did Ferragamo do it? 1982 against the Bears. After he had left and then returned from the CFL where he toiled for the Montreal Alouettes. 
He left. He could have been in 1979. He took over and got them to the Super Bowl. But instead of resuming the starting position for the L.A. Rams, he ran off and took uh, some loot with the Montreal Alouettes. And uh, I will say, as a side note, I've spoken with him a couple of times. He is one of the great – that a uh, bigger surprise than him throwing for 500 yards is what a delightful character he is. He is a, he's a really funny and uh, good guy. Vince Ferragamo. Yeah, Shab, I'm being told, he was actually three yards away from reaching that number twice. Huh. You what? went all the way through. It's Shab, Gerbach. Ferragamo. That would have been a list with Drew Brees, Ben Roethlisberger, and Matt Schaub as the only three quarterbacks to throw 500 yards, but – I could have thrown. That's a bummer because I could have just as easily thrown out any of the other high-profile guys like uh, Brady, Reno, or Brady. Instead, I settled on. All right, let's quickly wrap it up. If you've been paying any attention on YouTube or to the DDFP, and as always, we appreciate you subscribing on iTunes or Stitcher or consuming it in the other fine five podcasts here at uh, the NFL. By going to nfl.com slash podcasts, we have our video up there. You can also track it down at uh, Damashek if you look on my public page there on Facebook. Isn't that weird? I have a public page, Wes. How does that happen? I don't know. I'm called. I'm considered on Facebook because you have to like have a category of some sort. I'm a news personality. I think who put those I'm wheels doing. in motion for you? I don't know, but I'm but I'm a news personality. I'm not not a because they said well we could mark you as a journalist and then I laughed. I said well that would <laughs> that, that would be weird, and then entertainer also too weird. So just news personality. That checks out. <laughs> We are one week into our fantasy game here, Wes. I know you don't uh, watch the throne. I do. I've seen. Every, Wait, you do? I've seen every episode except the last two episodes. Oh my goodness! Well, then don't look at those standings if you're watching right now and you aren't up to speed like Wes. Don't you watch it either? But uh, obviously, uh, the uh, all I will tell you is if you don't know what's going on, Handsome Hank is in the lead. Uh, one of his uh, one of his big time choices came through in a big way. Look at him, plus 30 right Whoa, now. Whoa, you're bringing up the rear. Yeah, I'm in last place right now. I'm minus five, even behind both producer teams behind the glass. It's embarrassing, but I expect a big rise from my guy, uh, John Snow. Um, he's he's really going to – and also Dario, you know, Daenerys' uh, mm-hmm. fella, handsome uh, fella. He's a killer, too. I think he's going to turn it on for me. Hey, Michael Fabiano, fantasy uh, Hall of Famer, has weighed in on what he anticipates – his fantasy spoiler notes for our alert. Game of Thrones. Yeah, spoiler alert. Plug your ears, Wes. Hey, guys, let's take a fantasy look at the upcoming week of Game of Thrones, Episode 5, titled The Door. Daenerys Targaryen is an obvious must-start across the board. I mean, last week, she held her own cow style barbecue and earned double-digit fantasy points for a multiple-kill week. Now, I don't necessarily think she has more kills in her immediate future, but she could have a little fornication celebration with her boy toy and fantasy sleeper, Dario Naharis. I mean, come on. He sees Khaleesi come out of that fire all naked, and you don't think he's got a little something on his mind? Like Daenerys, Ramsay Bolton is also a difficult character to sit in the fantasy world of Game of Thrones. Anyone who'll sick a dog on his daddy's baby mama and her newborn son, that's a good bet for a kill every single week. Now, the sister of Ramsay's former whipping boy, Reek, or is he Theon Greyjoy again? I don't know. Yara Greyjoy is up for a promotion as she stakes her claim to the Salt Thrones. Of course, she could also be killed by Euron Greyjoy, who threw his brother Balon off a bridge and to his death two weeks ago. The family's never really been a reason not to kill someone in GOT. Just ask Tywin Lannister, Robert and Renly Baratheon, John Aaron, anyone in House Bolton, the Greyjoys, you get the point. Either way, Yara's a major fantasy sleeper. I mean, has there ever been anything more produced on DDFP than that little Fabiano nonsense? Nevertheless, it was great fun. <laughs> Good stuff from uh, Fabiano. Yeah, that Greyjoy family. Now all of a sudden I have to worry about what they're up to all the time. Off in the whatever. Where are they from? What are the, What's their place called? The Iron Kingdom or whatever? Iron Very Islands. Cute. The Iron what? Iron Islands? Iron Islands. I don't know. And I, you know what? I'm not interested in hearing from everybody on social media about how little I know. I'd like for you to be uh, to have to recite what their names are and what their relationships are to this, that. And the, I don't know what it is. I just look at it and enjoy it and somehow don't understand it. You don't have to take that from them. I, I, you're, you're exactly right. I'm already catching heat from Brad Childress. Here's my team, and it uh, remains almost the same. 
I don't want to tell why I now have in my uh, tier three. I had to go to the free agency wire because my original tier three pick uh, is dead. But out of uh, respect for Chris Wessling, who's still catching up, I won't say who that person is or was. John Snow is my tier five. That's my number one pick. Dario. Now Ty in Sand. I don't even know if I'm saying her name right. She's the witch lady who put the poison on her lips to kill the Lannister girl. You know? You know which way? She's in charge yes. of all those witches in Dorne. Those sands, They're not even witches, maybe. But. Those sands are not to be trifled with. But we talked about it before. Where would you most live? That would be where you would want to live, right, Wes? Dorne? No. No. Uh, you you like an island. Give me Yeah, give me that beautiful island there. Come on. You want to do well? Marine is too filled with turmoil right now, but so is King's Landing. But King's Landing, I think, has it all. King's yeah. Landing seems seems like they have nice fresh produce all the time. King's Landing's where you want to be, but life's too short for the North. Yeah. Well, I, I like I said though, I would you know there's something nice about Winterfell. It seems very cozy until winter falls. Well, but it's, it seems like it's always snowing. We've yeah. never seen Winterfell with green grass. Snow's overrated. I listen. I I kind of agree. I certainly want to want want to be up at the wall. Obviously. Well, at least in this situation, you don't have to scrape your car in the morning. Yeah, that's true. Wonder, but do you do that with your horse? We. I imagine there are some tasks you wouldn't want to do in the snow. Yeah. See, Wes. Oh, we should have gotten Wes. We should have if we had it to do all over again. We get Chris Wessling involved in the uh, in the Game of Thrones draft, yeah. but what's done is done. And, next year, and Handsome Hank. There's is, always uh, next year. Handsome Hank's getting his this week. You'll see. You'll all see. Damashek is ready to rise as winter approaches faster and faster. We'll be back with more Huey and Applesauce for you next week. Thanks to Chris Wessling again around the NFL podcast and pages. Patrick Claybon, all the fellows behind the glass. Kyle Long. Talk to you next week. Thin slice of heaven. <laughs>